The Song of Mary Entler, Part 2, Rebel Mary Carries the Secret Mail. She recalled a typical mail run for Confederate sympathizers. We collected all letters and concealed them by carefully sewing them between the rushing and dress. It required neatness and patience to make the work look innocent of anything contraband. We started on our march one bright, beautiful morning, but the roads being soft and muddy, and we being not yet accustomed to marching, could not get over much ground as rapidly as Stonewall Jackson's men. The first night was spent at the home of Mr. Foley, where another mail was collected. Another bright morning blessed our errand, and when the purple shades of evening were gathering in the west, we entered Charlestown as leisurely and passed the Union soldiers as indifferently as though we were out for an evening stroll. What triumph it would have been for them to have secured that mail. How they would have gloated over every sacred sentence in those letters. My heart thrilled with fear at the thought, although apparently so indifferent to their presence. the sad fate of the Great Western Hotel. War eventually broke the Great Western. The 12th Pennsylvania Cavalry, called the Bull Run Racers, crossed the Potomac River on December 26, 1862, with, as a townsman wrote in his diary, a fire in their eyes for revenge for the murder of local man Mort Cookus near Dam No. 4. They recrossed the river back to Maryland, also after removing the Great Western's fencing for firewood, along with the remaining apples and vegetables available at the hotel's garden and small orchard. Worse still, in late August 1864, Company H of the 116th Ohio Infantry very roughly occupied the hotel. Entler wrote her United States Senator Matthew Neely long after the war seeking compensation that from their regiment every partition in the front bedrooms were destroyed, all but two of the colonial mantelpieces were burned, the floor in the garret of the back building was also destroyed, enough of the new window sash and door frames for a house was lost. The cistern and well floors were destroyed and the cistern filled with beehives and rubbish. A fine dress stable with 25 stables partitioned off with boarding partitions in the upper story were divided off for grain and sleeping quarters. All was torn out and this weakened the roof so that when the snow came it collapsed. A brick carriage house met the same fate. Wartime Shepherdstown each day. Mary Antler recalled, 1863 still finds our town disputed territory and a veritable deserted village. Old men, women, and children with a very few Union men. In time of war when both armies have fallen back, a town presents a most desolate and forlorn appearance. The old people, women and children have no definite plans. They stand about in groups, writing and talking of the latest battle or the expected skirmishes. Their homes are places to retire from inclement weather rather than to adorn. The table to satisfy hunger rather than the delightful board where sweet companionship mingled with health-giving food. No systematic housekeeping, no aim, no object in performing any household duties. All energy was concentrated in doing for the soldiers. When our boys come home, we will do thus and so, was the oft-repeated phrase. Sometimes at the dead of night, the report of a pistol shot would warn us that the rebels were in town. But when daylight came, we saw only the blue coats patrolling the streets and they would leave as mysteriously as the rebels. The Sidetracked Mission May 1863 
Mary Entler's dangerous mission gets sidetracked. Confederate raider Andrew Leopold, whose sister Sally Ziddle was a friend of Mary Entler's, had been captured in late April 1863 near Berryville and taken to jail, awaiting trial for murder and other crimes. Sally Ziddle asked Mary Antler to accompany her to Winchester to plead mercy for her brother. Antler wrote, A beautiful May morning, balmy air wading the perfume of flowers over the country submerged in war. Sparkling dewdrops resting in the bosom of such blossoms like tiny teardrops, weeping for the sad hearts made sad by war. God since beautiful days in war as well as peace. We must remember that. A young, prepossessing girl introduced herself to me on this May morning as a sister of Andrew Leopold. She told me her brother had been captured by the Yankees and was confined in Fort McHenry, Maryland, and that the entreaties of her widowed mother had induced her to try to get through the federal lines to have an interview with General Jeb Stewart. She hoped he would have her brother exchanged as a prisoner of war. She had been sent to me by a southern woman who knew I had carried letters through to Charlestown and thought I would accompany the young lady to that place and acquaint her with friends who would assist her through the lines. I hesitated a moment and she said with tears that his mother had a message from Baltimore that if some powerful influence was not brought to bear immediately that her brother would be executed as a guerrilla. That decided the matter. We started off in a one-horse carriage for Charlestown. She, as a traveler, was attired in a brown suit with a cape to match trimmed and quilling around it and a brown straw hat with a veil. I was to spend the day only and was dressed in a blue Dolly Varden pattern dress blue silk bonnet with wide turnover cuffs and concealed in the lining of these cuffs were slips of paper with names of prominent southern sympathizers who we were to call upon for any assistance. Before starting we concluded it would be better to go under fictitious names, she as Lucy Hamilton and I as Louise Hamilton, her cousin. With hearts filled with hope, we started off that bright May morning on our errand of mercy. Charlestown was reached in good time. We stopped where we were directed at Mrs. L's and urged for safety to stay all night there. Lucy, to start next morning southward and I to return home, would rouse no suspicion. The next morning was quite as beautiful and arrangements were completed when I found she was getting timid about starting off alone. She entreated me to go just as far as Berryville, and then she thought she would feel brave enough to travel alone. It was a big undertaking for two girls, as the country was then all excitement and confusion. I finally agreed to go to Berryville. We knew exactly where to stop and whom to see. All was planned before starting from home. I'll never forget how beautiful Berryville looked the morning we drove up to the hotel. It was a village embowered in beautiful green trees, blooming flowers. The bees humming in the nectar-laden flowers produced that lazy, peaceful quiet that is so soothing to tired nerves. We made our arrangements with the proprietor and took a stroll through the pretty cool-looking streets. We met Union soldiers and plenty of them, but we did not feel any fear of our plans failing. In the evening, we called upon the family next to the hotel and had music until late that night. Next morning, while arranging to separate, we were visited by a Yankee officer, saying he wished to know where we were going, that we must take the oath. At first, we refused to take the oath. But when we consented to take it, he would not let us, but placed us under arrest. What a frustration of all our plans! How my heart ached for that poor girl! Under arrest by the Federals, General Milroy is flabbergasted. Antler wrote, Winchester reached, we were taken to the headquarters of General Milroy, 
where we found women, young and old, proud and defiant, now arguing their claims and proclaiming their grievances. One delicate, forlorn-looking widow relating to the general how his men, the Yankees, had taken her cows, her only means of support for her children. He turned from her quickly to my friend and me. If there had been the least disposition on my part to be humble, his exclamation put that feeling to flight and aroused a very rebellious state of mind. What in the devil are you doing here? If it were not for the women, running around the country we would not have so much trouble. My companion started up with surprise. General, we did not want to come here. We did not start for this place. Your officers brought us here. He ran his fingers through his mass of snow-white hair, already standing straight up like the quills of a porcupine, and out of the audience chamber he strode without another word. He presented a fine physique, tall, well-proportioned, erect in carriage, a wealth of snow-white hair which <laughs> suggested from its stand-up appearance that his fingers had a fashion of roaming there when troubles were to be, and plans and problems of great magnitude to be wrought out. Wrote author Catherine Baldow, Mary Antler spent six weeks in Harper's Ferry under house arrest at the Stipes Boarding House the best boarding house in town, adjoining the general's headquarters where a great many of the officers boarded. In an appeal for claims compensation, Antler wrote after the war, I took the oath of allegiance to the United States in June 1863 in Baltimore, Maryland, to Colonel Fish, who was in command there at the time. I had passed from General Lockwood, commander at Harper's Ferry, 1863, also from General Stevenson. Andrew Leopold, the fate of whom was the original object of their mission, underwent a long trial and was convicted of crimes and hanged at Fort McHenry, April 23, 1864, without intercession.